So yeah, everybody, welcome to the Angular Community Meetup. Uh, I am Brooke Avery. I'm here with my co-organizer, Jason Warner. So we're gonna run things tonight. We're really, really excited and grateful to have our three speakers. We'll introduce them more properly as the night goes on, um, as we get to each of their talks, but we do have uh, Jeff Welpley, Brandon Roberts and Preston Lamb with us. So thank you to all three of you. I think this is going to be a fantastic night of learning. So I'm really excited. Um, and then also I just wanted to thank our sponsors. We have ng-conf and then a new sponsor as of this month is JetBrains. So we're grateful for them. I am going to introduce our first speaker. Just want to get right into our talks and hopefully save some time at the end for that trivia game and our prize. But wow, tonight is going to be a lot of really good learning. I am really excited. All three of these talks are just powerhouse talks. So Preston and I actually have known each other for, oh God, has it been like four years now, Preston? Four or three and a half-ish, somewhere in there. Either way, Preston is one of these guys who is, when he says he's going to do something, he does it and he does it really well. Um, my, my introduction into the programming world was working at thinkster.io and I was helping developers make online courses. And we worked with literally hundreds and hundreds of authors, but it's really a huge undertaking to make a full on course. And so very few people actually complete and launch a course. And Preston was one of those few. So he has this amazing work ethic and he is just a really, he's an excellent teacher. He loves to share and contribute to the community. Um, you can actually read some of his blog articles. He's an NG champion with um, the NG comp blog on medium. So you can find tons of his articles there. Kind of the same story there. He's, he's one of the, the writers who just writes. And then next thing you know, he has another one already finished and he just keeps pumping them out. So he's definitely a contributor to, to the community, but that's exactly why he's uh, an Angular GDE. And he's a web developer based here in Utah. And um, yeah, he just loves building apps and sharing what he can with others. So that is Preston. His talk tonight is on RxJS tips and tricks, specifically mastering combined latest. So I'm kind of curious, Preston, uh, when you come on, I wanna hear why you chose of all the operators, why you chose that one in particular. But yeah, I'm gonna turn the time over to you. Sounds good, let me go ahead. Oh, okay. As soon as you stop, stop sharing, sharing, I'll share my screen, okay. Cool. All right. Okay, so yeah, like Brooke said, um, I chose to talk a little bit about combined latest today. And, um, I'll talk about why in just a minute. Um, Brooke introduced me already, um, but my name is Preston and um, I live in Northern Utah. Um, and I've been working at Motive Health uh, for a little over six years now, uh, which is forever in software development. Um, Angular GDE, right for the ng-conf blog, thinkster.io author, all like she said. Um, and then um, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Preston J. Lamb. I don't post that much on Instagram, but occasionally. And then pjlam12 on GitHub. And you can go to my website at prestonlam.com. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so um, the combined latest operator, um, we've been um, working on a couple new uh, applications at work and I've been working on uh, redoing an, an, a really old application. Um, our first application we started in Angular. Um, I started it like uh, not long after I started this company and Angular was still in like beta um, versions, but it was an internal app. So we were okay with that. And so it's gone through uh, several upgrades and uh, it was just time to kind of start fresh and uh, get uh, everything up to um, to the latest best standards and stuff like that. And so uh, the API that we're working with, in some cases, um, we had uh, data that would come from two different API endpoints, um, but the display depended on kind of combining that data and mixing it and then showing it on the screen. And so I started looking ar around it at how I could do that. And uh, there's lots of ways to do that. 
uh, but in many of the cases, I landed on combined latest. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about um, about how to use it and, and stuff like that tonight and show a couple of examples. Um, but first, uh, what's what's the purpose of this um, this operator or um, or how to use it? Uh, first, uh, it's important to know that um, when you combine these operators, uh, the combined latest or when you use this operator and you combine the observables, um, it will emit a value um, any time that one of the observables that you pass into it emits and it repeats or it, it emits the last value from each of the observables. So that's a little bit confusing, but uh, when, when you see an example, it's a little bit more straightforward. <clears throat> um, so you'll, you'll pass into this uh, operator multiple long-lived uh, observables, again, that rely on each other in some way. Um, and then uh, you can compose a value from multiple observables using combined latest, and, and so that's another benefit of it. Um, a couple gotchas to, to remember. Um, no value is emitted until each observable emits at least one value. And in the demo, I'll show you an example of, of when that doesn't, uh, when it doesn't emit a value and you're expecting it to. Um, and then if you only need one value from each observable, uh, there's other operators that might work better. Fork join or zip or something like that may work better for you. Uh, but uh, if you... Um, if uh, if your observables are going to emit multiple values or something like that, then this is a, a great option. Okay, so uh, we'll start with this little diagram that I found, um, and we'll kind of talk about it a little bit, and then um, and then we'll move on uh, to some actual demos that'll help understand it a little bit. But at the top, the the top two arrows um, are two different observables that you have. Um, the top one emits uh, letters, and the bottom one e emits numbers. Um, and so you can see um, the, the third arrow at the bottom, um, all of the data is kind of paired together. So you have um, in the top two observables, A is emitted and then one is emitted. And then we get a, a value from combined latest of A1. And then another letter is emitted B and our value in combined latest is B1. And then two is emitted and B2, then B3 and B4 and then C4, D4, and E4. So um, it's uh, it's really nice because um, you don't have to you don't have to make uh, a second HTTP call. For example, let's say the numbers down there, the number arrow is an HTTP call. Um, when the top observable updates, it, you don't have to make another HTTP call for for the number. Uh, you'll just get whatever value was last. Uh, last came through combined latest. And so it kind of almost caches that response for you. Uh, so that's really nice. Um, we'll look at an example in a minute um, uh, of actually using this, but that's what it does. Um, you'll also see that there's not like uh, in the combined latest arrow at the bottom, there's not like an A null or anything like that. It doesn't emit until both of those observables emit a value. Uh, so a couple of good use cases, there's probably more, but uh, pagination uh, can be a good use case for this. Um, you could have a, an observable that um, when the pagination is updated, it um, combined with some other filters and then um, makes an HTTP call, for example, um, just filtering search results, which is one of the examples that we'll look at today. And then um, a, maybe a favorites list where you have a list of items and you have your user that come and they're both in an observable. And then um, as they click on um, items, then you can use uh, the, the list of items and the user's ID to, to build a list of favorites, for example. That was uh, something I saw on the internet. But essentially, anytime you have uh, two separate observables and you need to combine them in some way and uh, display that information on the screen, and either one of those observables um, may update at some point. Uh, then, then this is a great uh, a great use case for combined latest. Okay, so we're going to go do a demo. Um, I'll put this um, link into the chat so you can uh, follow along if you want. Just give me one second. Okay, then let me pull the stack blitz over here. 
and then zoom in some. <clears throat> okay, so um, I have just a couple um, components that I created uh, to, to show uh, how you can use combine latest. So we'll start in this button combination uh, component. Um, basically, all, all we have are two buttons and when you click them, um, it will update um, the, the number of clicks for each button. And then, but we're gonna output um, the number of clicks for each button separately and we're gonna combine and count the total number of button clicks. Um, I'm tracking the clicks inside um, a behavior subject, but you could do it um, in a number of ways. Um, and then, um, and that's that's pretty much it. So uh, I use the combine latest operator and you pass in an array of observables. Um, and then, so this, in this case, it's uh, the button one behavior subject and button two behavior subject. And then I'm just mapping those results um, the values come in in an array as well, uh, button one count and button two count. And then um, I'm just returning an object with the button one count, the button two count, and then adding those together. And so we can see it output, it starts with um, zeros. And uh, that's because in part, um, I'm starting the behavior subject with zero, but if I save that and restart, then you can see that it starts with one. Um, and then when I click um, on a button, then it updates um, button one and update and leaves button two alone. And then our total goes to two. And then if, as I click them, um, you can uh, see the updates to it. Um, so it's, uh, this is kind of a hard or like a, a contrived example, obviously. And it's kind of hard to see the, um, the caching, but, uh, um, or the, the kind of the replaying of, of the values, but when I click on button one, um, it just it it already knows what button two emitted last time, and so it just reuses that to to use that value to output in the object and to add it to the total. I don't have to um, manually get the value from that behavior subject because it's already in the the RxJS stream, and so it'll keep track of that for you. Um, Sorry, I've had a cold this week, so my throat is really dry. Um, but uh, but yeah, so that's that's kind of a contrived example of it. Um, but it shows uh, it, it shows you exactly what um, combined latest can do. Um, but that's not all that useful. So let's move on to um, the to another example, and that is the list filter component. So the list filter component, uh, we just have a simple uh, form that just has a, a text input uh, that we'll be able to filter by. And then we're going to output the list of items. Uh, the items I'm getting from, um, from this to-do service uh, from JSON placeholder um, API. And this API doesn't have uh, pagination. It just returns all of the to-dos for us. But that's you know a lot of to do's and so we want to be able to filter down those those items and a couple of the apis that i've been working with on on that update project that i talked about don't have pagination built into them and so this has been uh, a really helpful and useful way to be able to filter through them um, and uh, and show um, only the the items that people may want to see <clears throat> so um, i made uh, the the text filter um, part of a, a reactive form. You could do this again in a lot of different ways, um, but this, this works out really well. Um, and then I just use the value changes observable. Um, and I um, so that's, uh, we'll, we'll be watching that in our combined latest for our, our to-dos list. And then also um, the other observable is the actual to-dos. Um, now, uh, the first thing that I wanted to show, uh, we talked a little bit about this, how, um, the uh, combined latest will not emit any values until all of the observables that you pass into it have emitted at least one value. And the value changes observable here for this, uh, this input, uh, it doesn't emit anything until I type into it. So if I type an A, now you'll see everything pops up because it finally emitted a value. But if I refresh that, um, it doesn't start with anything. So that may 
that may be perfect for you. That may that may work for what you need. But if you uh, if you want to have everything show up to begin with, you can. Uh, uh, oh, oops. Okay. When I commented it out, it um, moved the parentheses for me. You can uh, do something like this, where you start with a given value. Um, in this case, an empty string for the value of my text filter, and then when I save. Um, it it will both of the um, of the observables will have emitted a value, and so then um, my to dos show up right away. So um, that's I wanted to show that if you ever are using combined latest and you think that you should be showing some data on the screen and it's not, it's probably because one of your observables have not emitted a value yet, and you need to do something like this or. Um, or just know that it's not going to show up until somebody types into the text filter, for example, or changes one of your filters. Um, okay, so the next thing uh, uh, to kind of demonstrate this, we're going to look into the um, network tab here, and I'm going to search for to-dos, and I'm going to refresh this, and it should pop up. Okay, so we can see down here, it's kind of hard to see, but um, we are getting the to-dos and we're making an API call uh, to get the to-dos um, and, um, and we've made it once. But um, as I type in into this text filter, um, you can see that you know we're filtering, but we haven't made any more um, API endpoints uh, and endpoint calls. And so again, that's because the combined latest operator, it got, um, a value emitted from the service get to dos, and then it just continues to reuse that value um, that that's in that observable every time. Um, in this case, the text filter updates. It gets a new value for text filter, but it reuses the value from the service call. And so um, this again, this has been really helpful on an endpoint where um, where we can't. Uh, pass a text filter or you can't, or it doesn't have pagination um, maybe. And so you get this big long list of things, but you want them to be able to filter in some way. Um, you can have a, a, a range of filters. And when those filters update, uh, then you can filter this big long list down into something more manageable, um, but you don't have to continually make calls. And in uh, the way that we were doing it before, because I didn't understand um, RxJS, and I didn't know about the combined latest operator. Is every time um, they would fill out, uh, you know, they'd type something in the uh, the text filter, and they'd hit like a button like update, and then we'd make another uh, HTTP call, and it would look something like this. Um, I'll just put this in here. It'd be like this dot to dos dot get to dos dot subscribe, and then in here. Um, I'd have my list of to-dos and then this dot to-dos list equals to-dos dot filter. And it, it looks something like that. Um, and, and we, uh, we'd subscribe in the component and then we'd filter there, but every single time they updated it, we'd make a new HTTP call, uh, so that we could update what was on the screen and, um, and that's unnecessary for us because every time we were getting the entire list back anyways, and this way we only make one call, but we can filter that list as many times as we want. And um, as you type in different things or you delete uh, your text, then it, then the screen is updated. Um, so um, so yeah, that's those are a couple examples of, of combined latest. Um, and it's been, like I said, it's been really helpful uh, to use uh, to use that operator instead of um, trying to, uh, especially because I, I didn't want to use the subscribe in the, the TypeScript file. Um, I was able to manipulate the data how I needed it to um, and, and display it on the screen um, without making multiple HTTP calls. Um, so that is... Uh, oops, hold on. Let me see here. I can get back over here. That's uh, that, but that's it for um, 
for my demonstration um, and for, for my talk today. So uh, hopefully that has been helpful for all of you and, uh, and can uh, give you some new tips and tricks to work with RxJS. The more I learn about RxJS, um, the more I like it um, and the more powerful it becomes and the easier it is to use. And so when you're, um, when, when usually when you have to do something with your data in your Angular application and you think you might have to use dot subscribe, uh, if you uh, search around, ask questions, uh, you can usually find an RxJ, RxJS operator that will help you accomplish what you need. And you can use the async pipe in your, in your template. And then you don't have to subscribe in the template or in the, in the TypeScript file. So uh, hopefully uh, that was helpful. And thanks for uh, coming and, and letting me take a few minutes and uh, reach out to me if you have any questions uh send me a message on on twitter or whatever and uh look forward to to talking to some of you perfect thank you so much preston i'm trying to see if i was noticing a couple questions over here in the chat so let's see if we can find them if you do have questions i'll put them in the q a for us everybody it's easier to find them in q a rather than chat because they get they get kind of lost in that flood of everything over in the chat um, That's a great comment from Jeff, and I totally agree. Um, Jeff says, one sign of a great talk is when I think during the talk, oh, wow, I'm literally going to change some of my code to use this tomorrow. Great job, Preston. There you go. <clears throat> it was, it was super helpful. I've actually been uh, doing some RxJS myself this week, so it's, it's cool to see what you have to share and... I love it. It was a great presentation. I like how simple you kept it as well. I think sometimes people feel like they have to over overcomplicate presentations, but I love how it was just clean cut and simple. So that to me is a good, a good sign of clean, good code. Well, thank you. Um, I'll answer a couple of these questions that I seen here real quick. Um, okay. I'll, I'll try and go fit fast because I know we have lots of others. Um, one of them says we're not just limited to combining two observables. No, you can put as many in there as you want to. Um, uh, most of the ones that I've used have been like two or three. They haven't been a lot more than that, but you could put as many in there as you want. Um, uh, someone asked about switch map. Um, switch map is different. Um, it's like when you have one observable like the uh, the query params um, from from the page, the activated route query params, and then you want to take that and make an HTTP call. And so you're returning an observable from a different observable. So it's kind of different from this. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's a little bit different. Um, I think that's... There's, uh, there's one in the, the Q&A that... that says, uh, this is from VJ, he says, good talk. One question, if I have multiple observables which need to be executed sequentially, what operators are available for such use cases? That one, um, I don't I don't know if, uh, if it was me, I don't know if there's a better one, but I would probably, that's probably another uh, time where I would use uh, switch map. If I had to do like one, two, three, and four in order, I'd, and especially if they, um, if like two depended on one, then I'd probably use switch map. I don't know if someone else knows of a better option than that. There probably is, but that's what I would use. Um, not knowing for sure, I'd probably use switch map. But there's there was one more in the chat from um, Sebastian Rubio. He said that Preston mentioned fork join. What is the difference between this one and combined latest? So fork join, um, it does, it is kind of similar um, where you can pass in multiple observables. And then uh, when you subscribe either in the template or in the TypeScript file, it'll give you uh, the result of both of those observables, the values from both of them, but it only does it one time. Um, and it, it won't, if you update, for example, the text filter, uh, it won't um, give you the values again. So you would have to, um, you'd have to do some other work to get the value um, and to update your list, for example. So fork joins great By if you way, just need to get that, the data one time. I, the reason why I made that comment earlier in the chat is because that's sort of what I'm doing in all my code is, is like I like resubscribe to stuff to get the latest value, like because I just ha haven't looked as much into a lot of the different operators. Um, so it's, it's really useful for sure. Cool, okay, well, 
keep asking questions in the chat if you have them, but we are going to move on. Let me do a quick screen share here. All right, can you see that? Yes, no, yes, yeah. no, assume yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, all right, again, another excellent talk, and we're excited to have Brandon Roberts with us tonight. So he's going to be presenting on NGRX at scale, uh, specifically the good, the bad, and the ugly. But his talk is going to be on kind of like uh, what to do if you have a, a large group of developers working on an application and how to bring NGRX into the picture. So um, Brandon is no stranger to the community. We can often find him giving talks and presentations all over. Um, he's a, a workshop presenter at NG, NGConf. He's given multiple talks at NGConf and other conferences all around the world. But he is an Angular GDE and a web developer. He's currently working for App, right? Um, and then he is the co-creator and a maintainer of NGRX. So really there's no better way to be learning NGRX than with one of the, the co-creators of NGRX. So we're excited to have you with us, Brandon. Thank you for being here. And I'm just gonna turn the time right over to you so we can, can get right into things. But yeah, everybody, if you do have questions, put them in the Q&A and then at the end, it'll be easier for for us to, to find those questions. So thank you. And yeah, Brandon, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thanks. Let's see, screen share. Okay. Uh, so yeah, this is um, a talk I've been, uh, NGRX at scale, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, this is a talk I've been wanting to give for a while because I thought it was had some good insights and also learned a lot from uh, this project. So figured it would be a good opportunity to do that. Uh, Brooke and others already gave me a good intro, but we'll go through the, the normal spiel here. Uh, Brandon Roberts, you can find me on Twitter, or Brandon T. Roberts. Uh, go ahead and follow me there already. If you're not, uh, I tweet out gifts. I talk about sports um, and I block people sometimes, but that's just for fun. Uh, I am a maintainer on the NGRX project, along with some few other folks. So uh, we definitely have a um, good time maintaining that project, and a lot of people get a lot of value out of it. So happy to talk about it here. Uh, I am also a GDE, uh, uh, which means I've been in the community for a while, and I've contributed some, And uh, but that's not an exclusive club, so I uh, would challenge the people who are watching that to go for that too, just contribute to the community and uh, that good stuff. Uh, also a developer advocate, uh, Devro engineer at AppRite. Um, and you can find out more about that at AppRite.io. So quick plug there. Uh, yeah, so uh, for the agenda, um, I wanted to talk about the, I'll give some backstory about the project and I kind of talk about that some. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of things uh, gain there. I'll talk about some of the good parts, uh, some of the bad parts that, that I learned on this project, and even some of the, <laughs> the ugly parts that I learned from uh, working with NGRX and work, even working with a lot of developers and things. So, uh, and lessons learned along the way. Uh, so maybe that'll do resonate with uh, some. So uh, for some of the backstory, um, this is an enterprise, uh, enterprise project uh, with a Fortune 500 company. Uh, they will remain unnamed, of course, uh, but it was a, uh, like I said, a fun project to be on. Uh, had over 300 plus uh, developers contributing code at the peak of the project. So um, you, can, uh, you can probably imagine how much code is getting uh, contributed there uh, during the lifetime of that project that I was on it. Uh, went across multiple business units uh, in the organization, and it was an Angular JS to Angular migration. So, if you've done that before, uh, have gone down that path, you'll know that those things can uh, have their own challenges. So, I worked on NGX projects before uh, different sizes, but this was definitely the largest one that I worked on by far. So, I had some extra motivation to get this one right. Uh, so working with a lot of projects, NGRX. So yeah, let's get into it. Uh, so 
Well, we'll, we'll go kind of in reverse order here. So we'll get to the, the ugly part, ugly parts first. And I just say that ugly is the most challenging parts. So as I mentioned before, uh, you don't know what to expect going into each project. But as I mentioned, this one project already had a lot going on, a lot of developers, large project, angular migration, uh, and that sort of thing. So bringing into NGRX into this project already had a, a task to it up front. Um, so as I mentioned, it was an Angular JS application uh, spanned across multiple apps that was consolidated into a single uh, Angular application. And NGRX was uh, basically being used as a bridge between the two apps during the migration. Uh, so we were bringing in data from Angular JS, bringing that into the store uh, to be able to consume that on the Angular side. So like I said, working on migration, Angular, just Angular, if you've done that before, you'll know that there's pretty much two of everything. There's Angular, just Angular, which is, of course, separate frameworks on their own. We got UI router and Angular router, uh, two change detection systems. Uh, if you're familiar with root dollar root scope, that's it was in there a little bit, of course, a little bit of everything with app to these size. And uh, of course, in, uh, Global Store and the other different software development patterns that kind of evolved over time. And all this in a single uh, monorepo. So it was definitely like a web development, like history project. You can kind of see there's a little bit of everything as far as technologies go. And uh, the big part, of course, uh, state management was everywhere you turn. There's shared state, local state, and global state. So you name it, it's there. Uh, so how we, you know, remember how we developed apps in AngularJS? We had a lot of services. These things were kind of cobbled together. They created this like wild dependency graph, services and controllers uh, to get this application working. And this application was no exception to that. So of course, the when you have these this kind of architecture before, you know, it could be difficult to debug. Uh, some of the way that the things were built made it hard to trace data changes, and of course, as always, maybe not enough unit tests. So this is not where we want our uh, applications to end up. We don't want them to end up looking like this, but um, this was, like I said, part of the ugly parts of, of how we got through this migration uh, using NGRX. So, so look at the point, looking through the project, I actually found NGRX, uh, but it was the Angular JS version. Um, so if we take a look at a uh, so regular store aware component uh, first, uh, we have we read state and then store, uh, uh, read state from components and then store components notify the store of changes. So to read state, we use a store.select and have a selector there. Uh, so pretty, pretty straightforward there. Uh, components to it. If you're familiar with NGX storage, components dispatch actions uh, to communicate changes back to the store. Uh, so let's kind of take a look at the way this, this NGX store AngularJS version was in the app. Uh, it had properties that were directly on the store. So reading the store was modifying or reading properties directly from the, on the store itself. And modifying state was uh, instead of dispatching actions to uh, do that, you would just overwrite properties uh, directly from the store, kind of just mutating them in place. Uh, so, and multiple uh, services and components were uh, doing this. So you can imagine how that would get unwieldy pretty quickly. So like I mentioned before, it's hard to, uh, hard to track changes and see where thing changes were coming from and know where who was responsible for what. So part of this effort was to integrate NGRX, the NGRX packages into this uh, application. Uh, and this came with NGRX store effects. We pretty much used just about everything entity uh, in this project to, to untangle this uh, data. So we, still had to keep the existing data intact um, during the migration. So that was kind of the, the ugly parts of the migration that we had to work through. And this involved um, 
we still had injury store pretty set up straight for it on the angular side and out uh, and kept it pretty minimal on the angular js side as far as just dispatching actions to load data and that helped us to kind of structure uh, that structure the application in that way as far as the migration goes and keep a good clean separation between the two uh, so next up uh, is some of the bad parts about it so even like i mentioned before large project even using ngrx at this particular scale had had its own set of challenges um, i remember uh, especially enjoyed hearing this from another dear developer on the project uh, saying that NGX is too mainstream, and that's why they didn't they didn't use it. So that was <laughs> you may have even said something like this uh, yourself, or maybe other some words. Uh, I've even heard you know everything else, even words that everybody say word that starts with a B. But we'll save that for a different talk for a different day. But yes, there were some uh, growing pains uh, for uh, implementing NGX in this project. Uh, First, there were some attempts to implement NGX previously, which led to some uh, interesting usage, I would say. Uh, so NGRX, of course, built on top of these uh, component, built on top of these things being in place, like component patterns that I'll talk about in a minute. But some of those things were actually missing, and those things kind of help build up uh, what you want to do when you're building applications with NGRX, because the pattern uh, that it provides gives you guidance uh, as far as how you structure features and things like that but that's still only part of the the piece there so you still have to have some of those patterns in place uh, there were also different practices of ngrx floating around in the app as it was uh, some places we we're using facades i've talked about i've given a talk on facades before and how when to use those and how to use those uh, there was also just some vanilla NGRX in, in the application where people decided to not use facades or a mix of things there. So my guidance there would be to, you know, be consistent, uh, especially in, in large applications where uh, be consistent across how you're going to how you're going to use it. Uh, so it'll be have that same look and feel across uh, where it's being used. So I mentioned before about smart components being part of the equation and uh, smart components are um, and this isn't specific to NGRX, but it also helps you build applications that way smart components are where you have your business logic uh, for your application they talk to the store uh, they inject the store they maybe talk to services if you have still have some of those that you use uh, we did have some services that uh, had to use for like um, localization uh, so we did have some of those there and these smart components pass data down to presentation components and receive events from presentation components through outputs. And in the presentation components, uh, of course, no business logic there, uh, no services and uh, inputs from smart components. Um, there where they receive data and outputs where they pass that data back up. So this was one of the, like I said, one of the challenges. So if you have your store set up and you're looking to like take, take advantage of some of the pieces there, like selectors and things, that was one of the things that we kind of challenges that we ran into, some of the things that we had to uh, clean up first. Uh, there was also, uh, I call it bad action hygiene. Um, our buddy Mike Ryan gave a talk a few years ago about good action hygiene and like I said, if that if there's a thing that will uh, kind of torpedo uh, an Angular application that uses NGRX, especially like I said, at that scale of application, it'll be uh, misuse of actions. So uh, you've probably seen this. You may have seen this before if you're familiar with NGRX, but actions describe unique events. Uh, these are just a few examples of uh, how you would describe these events as far as the event and the source of where they came from. Uh, and you'll notice things like things like this. So uh, different, of course, di working with different developers and many different skill sets, uh, just try to, you know, basically bend the tool to their will. So uh, we talked about this before about actions being unique as far as where they came from. So if 
if you're familiar with that, then this will kind of jump out to you immediately of jump uh, dispatching three things in one place. Or uh, if we're looking at two different components, uh, when you're working with a large number of features, uh, you'll maybe want to load a set of data, uh, the same set of data from two different places. And you'll end up uh, dispatching uh, the same action from two different places in your app. Uh, but what we want to do is stay true to the, the model of NGRX and uh, dispatch one action uh, from that particular component. So it it's definitely takes a, to stay close to the, the fundamentals there that kind of work through some of those issues, even in a larger application, because they're just, everything just kind of gets magnified there. Uh, there was also uh, another part that was challenging uh, was NGRX in a monorepo. So we were using NGRX and NX together. And this was one of the things that um, even, even I had to learn. I was uh, working at uh, Narwhal, which of course is the uh, owner of NX. And they use NGRX in projects. And uh, some of the things that we ran into, as I mentioned before, with uh, NX is uh, maintaining that good action hygiene um, because you're sharing uh, the features themselves are going to have state um, uh, associated with them, but the actions themselves, some uh, also need want to separate those from the features. So uh, we had to, some of the things we had to struggle with were feature libraries and state libraries, because uh, what they ended up, you can run into uh, circular dependencies in that way. Um, because if you're trying to uh, put your state uh, close to your feature, uh, but then you want to have some uh, area that's impacted by those actions, then like I said, you can run into this space where circular dependencies are more common when you're splitting these things up into feature libraries. So that was one of the, one of the things there, but uh, I'll kind of touch on this on the, on the good side of things also, because it ended up working out in that way. Uh, there was also uh, no component, no NGRX component store. I know that a lot of people are fond of uh, NGRX component store and uh, this was actually still being developed while I was on the project. So uh, we think some things that we did have to kind of fall back on because one things that we did do was kind of using smaller services and subjects for some local state. And this is actually a good practice to uh, where we weren't just blanket using uh, NGRX everywhere. So, uh, but there, I would say there's some places where NGRX global state, NGRX was being used for global state that could be local, but I think those are set up in a way that if you wanted to detach from the global state and kind of remove those keys from there, that part was still there. Although that uh, option was still there and it wouldn't be a like a hard break to, to refactor that if, if, ne if necessary. Uh, so good parts. Um, I would say that we completed the uh, migration successfully, and it was um, due to some of the patterns and practices that uh, we implemented uh, with NGRX itself. Now, I know you're saying, hey, you're the maintainer. You should, <laughs> of course, you should uh, have good patterns and practices, but uh, you still have to be able to communicate those things in a, in like I said, those large projects. Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, we had minimal uh, NGRX on the Angular JS side, and this was intentional because we didn't want to re-implement uh, dispatch or re-implement uh, selectors and uh, the other part, like having complex actions and or having actions that you know had. Uh, from dispatching from a lot of different places in AngularJS and select their usage on that side because they were moving away from that. Uh, so that was definitely one thing there. Uh, shared data are really being strict about shared data in the global store. And this was so that the particular business units, they were still pretty isolated from each other. So we didn't want to have things there that weren't uh, necess necessarily needed to be there. Uh, we also slimmed down the components, as I mentioned before, by implementing the smart and presentation component pattern. And that allows, you know, NGRX to be integrated a little more smoothly as far as the uh, one-way data flows there. 
organization organization of features. I talked about the monorepo uh, setup with NX and how we broke the the some of the shared state into their own libraries, and then use those uh, features or uh, shared actions and other shared data together, and also increased um, team velocity because once we uh, got the training and got everyone on board with uh, how we were building features and using NGRX in that way, then there was a lot of impact that happened because of that, because we brought a lot of structure there. I think that's one of the pluses that uh, NGRX provided in, in the long term was structure for teams to be able to count on. And we were also able to automate some of these things by, with generators and uh, schematics. Uh, for setting up features that were already were connected to the store, or even if they didn't need to be connected, we were able to uh, automate those and provide guidance along the way for that. Big thing about no more shared mutated state. I mentioned the NGRX and AngularJS was, it was fun, but it had to go away. Uh, so being able to move those things into proper uh, shared state definitely went a long way. and developers became more aware of even performance impact uh, by breaking those things down, breaking those components down into uh, more responsible and less responsible ones and knowing where to look for business logic and no more uh, service spaghetti. Now, there's also the kind of the testing angle there to make that uh, the testing of those components uh, easier in that way um, by and that in these partly came where we were only using the store in certain components. So there was one listing or many less things to inject in, in those areas. Um, as I mentioned before, using uh, NGRX and NX in the monorepo, and I talked about the um, kind of the structure that that provide, provided as far as using the, the shared libraries there uh, for that. And it just, like I said, some of the things that came out of that as far as being able to use, still maintain that good action hygiene and putting those shared actions in a library themselves and still having data access libraries that were separate from the state library. So you could actually see where those dependencies between, even see where those dependencies between AngularJS and Angular were, or you know if you're migrating for something else. Uh, and we were able to clean up the circular dependencies. Like I said, that was an issue that we ran into uh, but just structure wise, but like I said, using shared libraries, uh, we were able to do that. And ultimately we got back to the fundamentals of uh, NGRX where we had shared state and we use actions and reducers get to decide how state changes. And I think you can see where this is going here. So we have, we go through the norm normal effects effects decide when to call services. And these things, like I said, magnify themselves over time. I can remember a feature where, uh, or even like one of the particular business areas wanted to load data from like six different places uh, before the act page actually loaded. So, and this actually could be done through many different ways. So you can see how that kind of uh, indirection with actions and effects uh, would handle that. And selectors, of course, uh, were, uh, one of the, some of the good parts that came out of this, we were using uh, selectors for querying data. Um, we had, more, like I said, multiple areas of data that we were uh, combining um, to uh, get that data for a particular feature or a particular page. And so we were using selectors to combine data and then feeding that data to the component himself, itself. Uh, some features actually came out of uh, this project also where uh, we were looking at how can we kind of make this process smoother for like future apps as far as um, taking some of the things that uh, you had to do as far as creating features uh, with NGRX and kind of taking some of that those things learned and this actually create the create feature um, functionality uh, idea for that some of that came out of this project also uh, so lessons learned um, of course, NGRX is going to be different from project to project. Um, I always say this, uh, even if you're learning NGRX, invest in learning RxJS because it'll take you 
a long way there. Um, if you're, uh, I would say start start out with light, like I said, maybe something more lightweight. If you want to invest in that, the uh, Indirect store and this, of course, component store is out there now, so you can uh, use that and, of course, build that up as you need to. Um, and then that could kind of give you that more uh, solid foundation. So when you actually use an Indirect for features or large applications to be able to uh, uh, go through that. Uh, so to recap, like I said, okay, the backstory, we talked about the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, and lessons learned that uh, I had along the way of building uh, Injurex from a maintainer side against, you know, real apps, because I really still really enjoy that part of it. And uh, like I said, lessons learned about that. Thanks. Awesome. Here we go. Got Zoom issues of my own. Thank you, Brandon. That was really amazing. We've got tons and tons of comments over here too. So let's get straight into. Oh, great questions. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> let's go to the Q&A. And then um, Jason, if you can kind of help me filter through the questions and things there in the chat, I think that'll be helpful. But let's see, Absolutely. we have. Cool. Okay. So I'm sorry if I mispronounce this, but it's, I think it's Yosh in the Q and A. He says, if we have to fetch more than 10,000, let's say one M records, how many can manage with this scenario or how, yeah, how we can manage with this scenario. If you have to met, fetch more than 10,000 records, um, as far as the store itself, uh, if you're putting that data into the store, like, Managing it with like Indirect's entity or something like that, you know, ten thousand records isn't going to isn't going to impact um, the application in that way. Even the, even if you're storing that data in memory, uh, we like I said, we stored a lot of data in these larger applications and uh, didn't see any significant slowdown there. So it's I think it uh, a lot of it depends on um, how maybe how long you retain that data. I know that is something that uh, people have reservations about is how long they want to keep that data in the store. But as far as putting 10,000 records in there, I don't see it as an issue. Now you may want to like incrementally load that data in there, but like I said, in the, in the case that you have to load all that data in at once, then I don't see an issue with the store itself being able to manage it. Cool, okay. And Kita, she asks, would presentation components have stores in them? Presentation components would not have uh, the store injected in them. In general, presentation components wouldn't have any uh, services injected into them. Um, I would say that maybe the exception would be, like I said, localization. Uh, we were using uh, Translocal on the project, um, so we needed to uh, use that to inject even in the presentation components just so they because they were of course it was um, supported multiple languages but in general the presentation components are to be kept pretty thin and only kind of communicate through inputs and outputs if we're like following like pretty standard angular practice there okay all right so brea torres she says how do you know if ngrx is a good candidate for your angular app mm -hmm. um good question i think that and i can kind of fall back on what we promote as far as if you use an ngrx is i think you would have you have to have a lot of you would have a lot of shared data in your application I'm, and i'm speaking more specifically about the global the global store uh, injuries, which I think is more prominent, but um, I would say that you would use the the global store for like app data that's shared across the entire app that's been used in many different places. And we we came up with the the if you go to the Injurex docs the Sherry principle, uh, which is named after someone we actually know, <laughs> uh, that gives you kind of those guidelines of uh, what when you would need to use it. Or if you could just fall back to something like uh, Injurious Component Store, which is a little more lightweight, a little more component focused uh, that you could, and it's more like a service with a subject, but you know, with some structure around it uh, that you, if you don't wanna go down the whole uh, global store and effects route, uh, Component Store is like a lightweight introduction 
uh, to that. Um, and it's a little more familiar if you're used to using Angular services and things. So definitely check. I think we got you covered. <laughs> I would say we probably got you covered on either way, whether you want to use a global one or just use component store. Uh, that's just a, kind of the decision how much you want to use the global one for. But I wouldn't say, I say as a rule, don't use it everywhere. I can say that with uh, <laughs> from experience. Don't use it everywhere. I can say that, uh, like I said, from learning and over time and you, that usage. So best way to learn, hands on <laughs> yeah. through now, through uh, trial and error, right? Yeah, not having a lot of experience, Brandon, with NGRX. Could you uh, pretty easily combine the the global store with component store? So you could uh, kind of use both of those uh, patterns that you were talking about? Yes, definitely. And um, I think that there's a place for for both of them uh, in an application, like I said, uh, for like if you want to just use the, like I said, the global store for things that are shared and used across many different areas and they have component store be more of your um, smaller local component state um, to use it there. So yeah, you can definitely use those together uh, in that way. I've, I know there are people, I think there are people in both camps. Some people use just the global ones. Some people just use component store. Uh, some people use them together um, just because they, they serve kind of different purposes, but yeah, definitely. Okay, I'm going to take two more questions just so that we can have some time for Jeff. But Craig would like to know, what's your opinion on NGRX Slice? NGRX Slice. Uh, I like NGRX Slice. Shout out to Chow. I know the, the maintainer of that. Um, I think that um, we, at least on the, the, the core, I say NGRX core side of things, we tend to promote uh, action using uh, good action hygiene and injury slice, although it consolidates, um, consolidates every, like your actions and your reducers together, uh, you do can run into a situation where you would, you kind of have to make that trade off of how you want to use that, whether you want to use the actions in that way, or you want to consolidate everything into a particular slice. So, um, I think if you if you're okay with that trade off, then I think it's a fine library to use. I like to see more uh, people um, using or built like I said, child built that library. I like to see more things come out like that. They at least kind of show the different use cases and things. So, um, yep. Hey, see, I've got one here. Jason is saying there's there's another good one in chat. So I, I think I'm going to squeeze in two more. <laughs> okay, Brandon, you just have you have too many good questions here. <laughs> uh, okay, so Jeffrey says, how do you feel about the wide disparity in boilerplate between full NGRX versus component store? And then in parentheses, he says, fully acknowledging that that is much better in NGRX than it used to be. Yep. They said they had to throw the boilerplate in there, but that's okay. I'm going mm -hmm. to roll with it. Um, <laughs> they are meant to serve two different uh places well let me let me take a step back the boilerplate that you mentioned in ngrx is part of the machine it's part of the way it works it uh serves the purpose of uh moving uh being able to access data from a different different areas of the app so and you have to do that that actions serve that purpose in that way uh and then component store like i said it's meant to be more lightweight it's meant to be more uh locally focused even though you can use component store globally um so uh yeah they they uh they serve a purpose um like i said they can be used together but um there like i said there's a difference there for a reason so you have to choose which one you want to 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 or not which one you want to use how you want to use them effectively i would say i hope i answered your question hope i didn't black out on the bullet plate <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know we were allowed to use the B word around you, Brennan. Hey, it's fine. I can't <laughs> block you on Twitter, or I can't block you in a Zoom call. So maybe they'll <laughs> ask me again on Twitter, and then I can exact my revenge. Then, <laughs> awesome. Um, there was a there was an interesting question in the chat. Um, who is that? JB Josh Black says. 
Annex provides a set of useful helper functions that enables the developer to manage state in Angular with an intentional synchronization strategy and handle error state. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion on the value of these functions? Optimistic update, pessimistic update, fetch, et cetera. And are there any plans to build in similar functionality to NGRX itself? Right, and I think you're uh, talking about the NX um, data persistence service or the data persistence operators more specifically. Uh, I like those operators. I think that um, I actually worked on those when I was at Narwhal to um, kind of integrate those in just using the, making more promoted use of the operators. Um, but I think they are a good teaching tool if you want to kind of show people have a more structured approach of how you handle optimistic and pessimistic updates. Uh, I don't foresee us building something like that into the core of NGRS because we want to keep, we pretty much keep things very flexible in that way. And I think that's part of the, the flexibility of NGRX uh, that you can build those type of things on top of it. And we don't have to build everything into the, into the core. So uh, people have definitely extended it in a lot more ways than we could, you know, fold into the framework itself. So we kind of look at those things as um, the things that would kind of help the mo help the most developers uh, that are co most commonly used. So, um, and I think that's kind of what we use as the baseline for things that we add versus things that are kept in user land, as I say. Awesome, thank you. Perfect, okay. Well, those were excellent questions. Again, thank you, Brandon. We appreciate your time. It's always yeah. fun to learn with you. Yeah, thanks for all the questions. Definitely. Okay. All right. Let's get on to our last talk. And then um, I think we're right on schedule, everybody. We should have some good time for the trivia game at the end. So let me share my screen again really quick here. We'll get our last speaker on. Okay. So we have Jeff Welpley with us, everybody. This is going to be a, a really fun talk. Um, not that the other two haven't been, but uh, I'm excited because he's, he's, going to be talking to us about where is Angular headed in order to provide the most optimal experience for first time users. So he's kind of like projecting forward into the future. And I think these are important conversations to be having, you know, what, what's going on today, but what can we be doing today to be planning for tomorrow? So I'm excited to hear what he has to say. Um, but just to give you a little bit of an introduction on Jeff, he is the CTO and co-founder at Get Human which I believe is what his shirt is there in his, in his picture. Um, but that's where they, they specialize in getting human, not just automated customer service info for literally thousands of companies around the world. So that is nice because we don't like speaking to automated computers, right? Um, but he's also an Angular GDE and the co-creator of Angular Universal. And then he is the co-organizer of Angular Boston and Boston AI, and is also a former host of Angular Air. So definitely we're excited to have you with us, Jeff. Um, I'll kind of just turn the time over to you, but yeah, thank you for being here with us. Thank you, yeah. <clears throat> All right, let me share my screen and start up the presentation. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm Jeff Welpley. Uh, like the intro, I am the CTO and co-founder of Get Human, Angular GD. I'm also one of the um, original creators of Angular Universal, which does uh, server rendering for Angular. Um, also uh, less well known, <clears throat> I was the uh, main creator of Angular Preboot that I'm gonna talk about. I, I don't think a lot of people understand or know about that library, but I'm going to explain what that is and and how it can be used today to help with the initial loading experience. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm here to talk about: is what is the initial, uh, the ultimate uh, initial loading experience for Angular apps in the hopefully not too distant future. I'm definitely going to talk about a lot of stuff that's available today and stuff that you can do to make your apps fast for first time users. But I'm also going to be talking about things that are going to be coming. Uh, one thing in particular that is very important that's uh, you, you know on the horizon. 
Um, so this is going to be a sort of high level talk. I think I, I like Preston's talk. It was uh, very low level, very detailed. I give those talks sometimes. Um, there's just way too much material that I wanted to cover in this particular talk. So it's more going to be kind of an overview of a lot of different things, but I'm including a lot of hopefully good tips that even people that are um, performance experts will get at least a few good nuggets in here that uh, I'll include. So uh, everything I'm going to talk about is going to center around one big question. How can you make your app the very best of the best of the best? Uh, in terms of performance for, for first time users. And uh, good is not good enough. Uh, we wanna be literally number one. Um, so when you're number one, I mean, this is sort of what it looks like, right? When you get, <clears throat> do um, light, use Lighthouse and you do your performance analysis, when you get a hundred, there's not much better that you can get than that, right? I mean, it's literally the best. And looking at these stats, there's three in particular that I always, pay attention to. The other ones I, I, are sort of um, secondary or derivative of the other ones. These are the most important ones. Um, so largest, largest content fill paint or LCP is when the majority of content on the screen is visible. Um, anything under two seconds is good. Under one second, that's where you get into number one territory where you're the best on, on a consistent basis. I actually used to pay more attention to first content fill paint, but the reality is that users, even though it is important to see something quickly, when they see one little thing and then a bunch of other stuff pop up like over like a long period of time, it's not a great experience. Like you really have to see the majority of the content very quickly, which is the, the LCP. And then also time to interactive, TTI, um, where the user can actually start to interact with the page. And this is really important because um, I, I'm sure that a lot of you, <laughs> that are listening to this talk have experienced those websites where uh, it, you load the, the website and it looks like it's, it's there. You could see stuff, you could see a text box, you try to interact with it and nothing happens. You click a button, nothing happens. And there is nothing that is more frustrating in the world than that. So we, it's, it's super important um, that we get our time to interact with down, which is, is essentially optimizing how JavaScript gets downloaded and loaded because that's what's happening when you can't interact with the page is that the page is blocked from um, in allowing user interactions. So anything under two seconds is, is pretty good, is really good. Uh, under one second is the best. Uh, and then finally, uh, cumulative layout shift is a measurement of how much visible elements on the screen move around during the course of the rendering process. Um, so if you guys have ever used Lighthouse, you've done like the time series where you can see frame by frame how things load. When you see an element on the page appear in one spot and then shift around or, or because something else appears, a lot of times this happens with images that an image isn't there and then it appears and then it shifts everything down or adds or whatever else, anything like that it's a terrible experience. When users see that shifting, there's like some, something that sits off in their brain that explodes that they automatically just like get angrier. Um, so for sure, we, we want to essentially have this as zero, which means that nothing shifts during loading. So the perfect app is instantly loaded, instantly interactive and no jank. Uh, so these scores are, easy to achieve if you're using just a simple static HTML page. So uh, I, I generated these scores originally from a documentation page, an HTML page that has no images, is really small, just a static HTML page that served, up, no doubt, on a CDN and everything's optimized. So, I mean, of course that's going to be fast, right? But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an, uh, a legit Angular app that's much bigger, much more complicated, not just a few lines of simple static HTML. And so I've broken down <laughs> the initial loading experience for Angular apps into six stages. And I'm gonna spend the rest of this talk explaining how to achieve the maximum optimization at each of these stages. So first is the DNS lookup, which I mean, is really simple and simply consists of uh, your browser sending 
a domain name to a DNS provider and getting back the IP address. And actually, this is so simple that honestly, most of you guys don't even think about this. Um, but <clears throat> there is a difference in uh, how quickly DNS providers give back a response. Uh, but that's not actually why I included this as the first phase, because it's we're just talking about milliseconds. And even when we're trying to be the best of the best of the best, um, this usually doesn't matter too much. What is a bigger deal is the fact that a DNS outage will take down your site and many other sites. And while they don't happen every day, they do happen to almost every DNS provider from time to time. Uh, most of you probably remember just a couple months ago when there was a huge AWS outage in the US East One um, region, which basically took down Route 53. And so if you were using Route 53 as your DNS provider, your site was down, okay? And so the more point with this that I wanna make is that when you're trying to create a great initial user experience, when your site is down, it doesn't matter how great your uh, performance is, they're, they're gonna have a terrible experience. And so DevOps and, and how well you um, have redundancy in your site is important. Typically, most people, um, DNS is, is the single point of failure that like they have everything else, multiple servers, load balancers, et cetera. But DNS lookup, you know, your DNS provider goes down, you're, uh, <laughs> you're screwed, right? So how can you deal with this? Uh, so there is a trick. The trick is that at your registrar, you can actually register multiple DNS providers. You know, for the, this is in Google um, domains uh, as, an, as the example, but you can basically put name servers for multiple DNS providers. And here it's Cloudflare and DigitalOcean, but you can put whoever you want. And this will work. Like if one of these providers goes down, it almost never multiple providers go down. I mean, if that happens, uh, it's the end of the world. Like you, you might as well uh, forget about this and start stocking up uh, on food and whatnot. But <clears throat> it does happen that one will go down from time to time, you know, once a year or whatever. And so just having something like this can protect you from that. The one caveat with this is that um, if you do do this, make sure that you use some sort of automated script to make updates to your DNS tables at each provider so that they stay in sync. If they get out of sync, there's all sorts of havoc that uh, can occur that is crazy that you just definitely do not want. All right, next up is uh, you know, server response, which is the time that it takes for your web server to process a request and send back a response. For Angular, this is essentially calling Angular Universal. That's what Angular Universal is built for, is take a request, a web server request, you know, at the web server level, generate HTML and send it back. And Angular Universal, uh, you know, I've, I've personally been involved with a lot of the development here, has gotten much, much faster over the years. It is very fast but it is orders of magnitude slower than, it, than if you were simply serving up static HTML files. So if you have a static HTML and you're just requesting that static HTML, that's gonna be way, way faster every time than calling any sort of uh, dynamic you know, runtime web server, um, including Angular Universal. So the trick here is to optimize your server response um, by storing the HTML that's generated from Angular Universal in some way and, and kind of reusing that for requests. And so there's two high-level approaches for how you can do this. You can either, you know, one, use a static site generator, something like Scully, which um, sort of upfront, you generate a whole bunch of HTML based off of um, config, uh, route configurations that you send into the static site, static site generator. Or uh, the second approach is to use a cache manager. Um, so something um, where you have, um, it takes an initial request where it would uh, still call you Angular Universal, but then it stores the HTML for subsequent requests. And so uh, this is the difference between the proactive or reactive approach. You know, proactive, you're doing it ahead of time, everything. Um, with a static site generator or reactive, it's reacting to what the request coming in. 
there, there's definitely advantages, disadvantages to each of these approaches, use cases where you'd use one or the other. Um, but the main point is that for a majority of the users, they performance wise are just getting the equivalent of just getting a quick static HTML. That's the, the important part. Um, and as a side note, there is like middle ground between these two options. You can have, um, you know, a set of reactive scripts that based off of certain conditions, you know, your static site generator generates a whole bunch of new pages or on the cache manager side, there's a thing called prefetching where you can write an algorithm to load up your cache ahead of time, even before a user um, makes a request so that it never actually, a live users will never uh, end up calling Angular Universal. So there's a, you know, a lot of uh, different options here, but the end goal is to optimize this server response, which, which is definitely possible today, definitely something that you should be doing. But then when you have the server response, you have the actual HTML along with other um, assets like job, um, images, CSS, et cetera, then you have to actually send them to the client. And there's three primary factors that affect asset delivery performance. Uh, first and foremost is the size of the assets, which can be optimized um, either proactively through a lot of your build time tools. So this is where the Angular CLI comes in huge, you know, which obviously uses Webpack underneath the scenes. Uh, and so that's at you know, build time, you're optimizing your JavaScript. It, actually, Angular is great about this because they, they've, and there's, it's been a huge, huge focus of the Angular team to make it so that the framework itself at build time, when, when you build your app, you know, goes away. Uh, and, and if you've looked at, if you used ng-build stats.json to kind of inspect what is the package, uh, what, what is the JavaScript that's actually being delivered, the actual uh, Angular framework stuff is very, very small. It's this very, very small runtime. And most of it is your custom code. So I, I use that besides obviously using all the build tools I can to optimize uh, my JavaScript, I, I will very regularly use ng-build stats JSON to view, uh, generate a, a, a readout of, you know, what is the, the biggest thing in my app and do I really need that anymore? Or is there any way I can cut that out, et cetera. But also there, there's reactive ways to do this. There's a number of services. I, I put in here some of the ones that I use, but there's a million other services that you can use um, as like kind of a middleware service that will, um, you know, automatically minify your JavaScript, automatically optimize your images, automatically, you know, optimize CSS, every, everything else, combine, you know, take multiple images and combine them into one, you know, a lot, a lot of things like that, um, that you can do kind of reactively. And really most people, uh, and you should be using both of these options to um, fully uh, optimize your, your asset delivery. And then there's distance. So physical distance does matter. If this, you know, if everything was just one fiber line between every endpoint between the server and a client, it probably wouldn't matter because then it would just be the speed of light, which is negligible for these distances. But the reality is that a packet that goes from, you know, California to New Jersey ends up going through a whole bunch of different net, network devices and network switches and, and other, um, uh, you know, sometimes uh, networks that aren't as, as good as, as uh, you know, the top ones, especially if someone's on cell service or whatever. So the, the reality is that distance does matter. And if you, you're, where you're serving up things from are far, further away, it is going to be slightly slower. Uh, so that's where CDNs come in, right? So that's where we have uh, copy our assets to multiple locations around the world. And just like with DNSs, you know, not all CDNs, CDNs are equal, even though they do help, all CDNs help. So if you are really, really particular and you, and you really want to be the number one, the best of the best of the best, um, it is worth your while to look into your CDN and compare them and see whether they have um, a POP or, or points of, of uh, presence that are close to your end users. 
And some of them have less than others. So like a company, just to pick one out, uh, like Akamai. So Akamai is like the industry leader in the space. And they have way more POPs than other CDNs. And so they actually can get better consistent performance um, than some of the other ones. And, and they can kind of prove that. Um, you'd have to pay for it. Yeah, they're more expensive. Um, but it is something worth uh, comparing if you are... Uh, you know, really want to get that edge. And then traffic. This is, you know, when I was thinking about this, it reminded me that uh, last month I actually went to Disney World and uh, with my family, it was great. Uh, it, it was a fun trip. However, you know, we, we sort of had this uh, thought going into it. They were, we were like, oh, you know, we're going to go on a lot of rides, the teacup, you know, everything else. It's, it's going to be, you uh, uh, you know, really fun. My, my kids were super excited. Uh, but the reality when we got there is the lines. Oh my God, the lines, like anybody who's been there recently knows exactly what I'm talking about. It is, I mean, there's always been some lines, but it is just ridiculous. Like two, three hours, like just so many people, like you, you, you're there, you theoretically could go on these rides. You're very close to them, but you can't actually get to them because there's so much many people. And that's what happens on the internet, right? Sometimes, um, you know, it's not a matter of being close to another, uh, between two things. Like if there's a ton of network congestion, it sort of slows everything down. Um, you know, so for uh, Disney, we, you would use, um, the fast pass. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's problems with this too, that, uh, you know, we didn't particularly like, uh, but if you, for the few times that you actually were able to work out getting a fast pass, um, you're able to essentially go on a separate line all the way to the front, bypass all the traffic. So for um, networks, for large networks, there is actually something equivalent to FastPass. Uh, it's called network prioritization. And it, it does, can cost a lot uh, You wait for companies like Akamai. Um, but, and, and it's something that like, it, I always assumed with, um, you know, thinking about like net neutrality, everybody equal, you know, there shouldn't be, uh, you know, priorities or whatever, but, but the thing is, I guess that across fiber lines, it's true that everybody is equal. Um, but within network devices that are owned by different companies, as things get routed through the internet, uh, that's not necessarily true. You can actually pay to get prioritized in periods of congestion. So when there's no congestion, this isn't going to help you. Like when, when, when there's not a lot of traffic, um, you know, you're going to be just as fast as everybody else. But when there's huge amounts of congestion at certain points within the internet, you paying for a service like this allows your traffic to get priority over others, uh, which is a little bit crazy, but it is when you want to be the best of the best of the best, this is something that may be worth your while. And I will mention that um, we, we actually um, get human. We actually ended up getting the uh, Cloudflare enterprise plan that has network prioritization just because it's like an order of magnitude cheaper than, than Akamai. Um, but there's, there's other providers too um, for this type of service. And then, um, you know, JavaScript execution. So this is, the part that I think a lot of you are probably somewhat familiar with. <clears throat> and it's also something um, where we get into the part uh, talking about things that are in the not too distant future. But before we talk about the future stuff, let's talk about how Angular works today. So today we have a static server render view and our Angular JavaScript executes on that server rendered view. And initially, um, uh, it's, it's trying to bootstrap the client uh, Angular app. But the problem is that today, Angular on the client completely destroys the server view and re-renders everything. Uh, the client view may look similar to, to the server view, but the actual DOM elements in memory and vis visible elements on the screen are all completely different. And in many cases, this process will cause like a flash of white to appear on the screen and then a ton of jank all over the place. In general, it's just a, by, by default, if you do nothing else, uh, it's really a terrible user experience, frankly. Uh, but 
today, before we get to the future stuff, even today, there's a few things you can do about this. Uh, so first you can use transfer state um, that basically takes the data that you used to generate the server view and it puts it you know, into a JSON object in your server view so that your client can take that and reuse it so it doesn't have to re-look up you know, all the data. And just th this alone does optimize a couple of things. So it doesn't um, create some of the delays, you know, the, the white flash is, is not as much, not as much jank, et cetera. Um, but also what you could do is use one of the libraries that I created, uh, Angular Preboot. So this is part of the Angular core. Um, they've made a whole bunch of updates since I originally created it, um, um, but it's really useful. And, and, it's, and it's, I think it's one of these libraries that not a lot of people know about. Um, but it is super useful when you are doing SSR. Um, so Angular Preboot, it, it basically allows you um, the Angular client app to render off in an off-screen buffer. So you have your server view that the, that the person is looking at that, that's generated. The Angular client bootstrap doesn't bootstrap on the server view. It bootstraps on an off-screen, like unseen um, uh, view. And then it swaps them once they're ready. So the swap occurs really quickly. And then there's also like a preboot also will record user events on the server view and then re replay them or whatever so that nothing is lost. Um, so, I mean, if you set this up, this does create a good experience. Like I, I've, I've set this up a bunch of times and you can have achieve those really top numbers for, for um, LCP, for TTI, you know, for all that stuff, like you can achieve it. But there are two big issues. One is that <clears throat> it, it does require a lot to set up. Like it's not like an easy, uh, everything baked in, just like, you know, add a configuration in your, you know, config file and, and, and it works perfectly. Like it does require a little bit of learning and understanding of what's going on. And it's easy to break, frankly, if, if you do the wrong thing. Um, but then second, there are a number of use cases where you really do need to keep the server view around. So even though th this solution does help with the um, the white screen and the jank and everything like that, um, there's some things like, for example, when you display ads. So like, uh, you know, on, on some of the sites that I've built, like we display ads, you can't destroy those ads. Like like the ads that get just, uh, rendered on the server view, have, you have to keep them there. Um, and, and there's other examples as well uh, of, of where you really do need to keep that server view. So what is, what is a better solution? Well, <clears throat> instead of replacing the server view, we could theoretically in the future have Angular hydrate on the server view, which means that the client event handlers would just attach themselves to the existing server view DOM elements. This is something that uh, React does today and some new frameworks like Quick are focused on. Uh, the primary challenge to implementing hydration with Angular is that um, it, it's, it's hard. I mean, there, there's, there's no perfect solution um, for how you match up, like how, when, you're, when you're firing up the client's side is, is um, starting, how does it know what server dollar elements to attach to? There's a lot of potential solutions they all have different downsides. Like, like it's all trade-offs, right? Um, in fact, um, one interesting side note here is that uh, when uh, Angular was uh, in beta first being created and when we were uh, creating the very first version of Angular Universal, I spent probably two months trying to build hydration in that very, very early version of Angular. And um, it, it was crazy because the way that they were doing um, rendering the client, um, it, it just was uh, very, very complicated. And I, I was way in way over my head. I, I, I went down a rabbit hole that uh, I needed like another couple of months after that to kind of reset. Um, but so I, I did try to implement this at the one point. Um, and kind of uh, had to throw in the towel. And, and we collectively at that point decided that it, we, we couldn't do it until the core of Angular got to a point where it was the logic for rendering was easier to reason about where you could 
create um, something that would hydrate um, much easier. So we're almost at that point. So like this is something that the team has, has talked about a um, number of times that like we, we now with Ivy and, and the latest changes, things are much more simple and straightforward. Um, so there are, have been a lot of discussions on these that you can start to follow on this issue. Um, this is something that is a priority for a number of people and they are thinking about not here yet, um, but it will be, uh, it will be in the future. Definitely. Um, I don't know when may take a little while, but it's something that it is sort of the solution that needs to happen and people are thinking about it and, and working on it now. All right. And then finally, um, from the user's point of view, <clears throat> their initial experience doesn't end just because the client is done bootstrapping, right? Um, the user starts to interact with the page during their initial interactions. And when they're doing that, data is you know, saved from the app to the back end, more data is pulled to keep it up to date, et cetera. And in many cases, this data sync pro process occurs between um, you know, the browser and one API endpoint. Um, however, thinking about all the stuff that we've learned so far, um, I think for at least some use cases, we can do better. Um, because your endpoint and underlying application servers are always going to be one particular location, right? Um, and so, you know, the distance, um, just in terms of performance, we can maybe use some of the stuff that we talked about earlier um, in a new way. And this is something that, um, I mean, I guess it maybe has been around in some degree in the past, but it is starting to become more popular. It's something that I've started to use a lot more recently, which is to use these providers that have, C a lot of the CDM providers are now starting to allow um, compute and database resources on the edge and not just file storage. So you can write JavaScript that runs on the edge, which means that your program you know, is distributed to these places you know, all around the world. And when you know, your, your browser you know, uh, requests data, requests uh, feedback, uh, even if it's you know, in China, it's not going back to the US, it's going to one edge location uh, you know, local. And so <clears throat> if you can, um, you know, there's obviously trade-offs here. You, it has to be uh, for data. It has to be something that you know is either read-only or eventually consistent. Um, uh, and or if you just have backend logic, it'll work. That um, you just want to use programming logic without data. Uh, so there's there's a couple of use cases that work well with this, um, but it's it's crazy fast. It, it is uh, amazing how how zippy. Uh, this will get your continuous interactions if you start thinking. It takes more work, takes more setup for sure, um, but there are benefits uh, if you are thinking about you know, performance for uh, user interactions during that um, you know, initial and ongoing um, experience. Um, and, and actually, I, I, I originally I was going to talk you know, in, in way more depth about uh, some of the stuff, the, the specifics of the, some of the ways I'm using this. Um, but then I realized it was going to be like another 30 minute talk. Uh, so I, I'm going to leave it at that for for now. Um, and, but I'd love to, you know, if your if your feedback either, you know, with with questions or you know, uh, send me on on Twitter uh, at Jeff Welpley or email Jeff Welpley at gmail.com. Um, and I'd love to hear about other things you guys are interested in. And, and uh, I'd be more than happy to do kind of more detailed talk in any of these areas that I kind of went over today. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, you guys having me. It's been uh, fun. Awesome. Well, it's been fun hearing what you've had to say. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to go through a couple of questions. Everybody, I know it's, it's like almost eight o'clock, but... I think we've had three really, really amazing presentations. If you guys want to hang out for just a little while longer to play some trivia with us, please feel free. If, if you can't though, it's time to go. We totally understand. Um, but again, it is for a, an in-person ticket to NG comp. So, I mean, there's that, but uh, yeah, so I have, we're going to go through a couple questions here from Q and a, 
uh, pop those over to Jeff. And then after that, we'll get right into our Kahoot game and play that trivia. But again, if you have to go, no worries. Thank you everybody for coming next month. We'll be meeting again last uh, Tuesday of the month, which I think is the 26th of April. So definitely plan on that. I can give you a little preview. Uh, we do have Dave Shevitz, uh, formerly of the Angular Docs. Um, he was the, the the team lead on that. So he will be one of our speakers. And then I, uh, if you've heard of uh, Brendan Nieder, Niedermeyer, who is actually going to be joining us all the way from Germany, which is a huge favor. So he's got a really great talk. Uh, prepared as well and then we'll we'll bring in one more speaker so already we have a great great uh, event plan for next month but Jeff let me pop these over to you um let's see all right Matt says what hosting service would you recommend that works best with angular SSR if you don't maintain your own servers such as Heroku app engine AWS etc yeah, I mean, for, for my default usually is to go with Firebase. Um, so for, for any like new thing that I do, I, I, I love Firebase hosting. Um, more recently, I've, I've gotten into doing like more advanced DevOps stuff where I create my own like uh, Kubernetes, which is like way, you don't need that for, for simple stuff. Um, but so for like anything more involved project, I, I, I do usually go down the Kubernetes route, but like for simple, like I just want something, you no know, servers, whatever. I, I always use Firebase hosting. Cool, cool. All right. And then last question. This one is from Steven. He says, Jeff, what's your mileage been with App Shell? Uh so to be honest, I, I don't think about App Shell that much just because um like it, it's a different use case, I feel like. Um, I, I just, uh, I, I just can't speak to it that much. Like, like most of this, so most of the time I'm either doing something, um, fully client over only that you, I don't care at all. Like one bit about, um, anything, uh, before I actually don't even care about initial performance that much at all. Or I do like the, I go way overboard on the other end, in which case I do all my kind of custom, um, not custom, but like I, I have a specific um, with it, with I do things with universal and preboot and a lot of stuff I mentioned here. Um, so there is a use case for that, but I just don't, me personally, I don't uh, use it as much. All right. Okay. I think I had a question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I had please. a quick question also. I dropped it in the chat, but uh, the question is, oh. uh, given how other frameworks have evolved in terms of SSR with like get static props, get service out props, those sort of things, would would you have done anything different with Angular Universal seeing how like those other uh, kind of frameworks have went down that path or do uh, you have any thoughts on that? Well, <laughs> I would have loved to. So uh, when we originally created it, there was a bunch of stuff we couldn't do because, um, I mean, this is like history type thing. <laughs> uh, like, so when, when Angular first came out, this is like the new Angular, not a Angular JS, right? Mm -hmm. um, like SSR was sort of an afterthought. Like, so the, the team did like, to their credit, like um, uh, Misco and, and Igor were are, are always awesome, and and they they empowered us a lot to do work, but but it was always that SSR was sort of a second class citizen, and, and I don't say that to be disparaging. I just mean that like their main focus. If you remember at that time, um, there was other client side frameworks, uh, which I'm, I'm just blanking on right now because I'm under the. Uh, from Google yeah. that that focused on web components and everything like that. And so like the thinking was very different that like, like mm -hmm. Misco would even say, it's funny that Misco has created quick because I had <laughs> so many conversations with him at that time that he mm -hmm. was like, oh, no one needs this anymore. No one, no one needs, uh, you know, server rendering or any of this stuff. Like it, it, it's all, you know, on the client and et cetera. So the way that they built the internal rendering engine, and I'm, I won't get into the details of it right now, but just like the short of it is that it was built in a way that it was almost, it was very difficult 
to Mm -hmm. build like a good SSR solution on top of it because you couldn't, um, you couldn't have logic that was in sync. Like, like it was doing like magic, you know, Mm -hmm. underneath the scenes. And so it was only after a while where they realized that they had to be much more simple and clear about the way that it worked so that you could do things like this. Um, so I, I think we did the best that we can. I would have loved to, we, we did talk about it and I would have loved to done things differently at that time if it was possible. Yeah, sure. Thanks.